Is it not beneath you to dismember this unfortunate Trandoshan? Thousands once cheered such a display, but those days have passed. In this more civilized place in these more civilized times, what was once celebrated in the bloodlust of the arena is now seen as horror and cruelty. I need you to lead a garrison. Your people are good fighters, and there's plenty of credits in it for them, too. The peace is intact, Mando. We took out that dragon. My people don't want to fight no more. Your town might be good for now, but it's all part of the same planet. I just... I want to give him this. Why? So he will remember you? No. As a Mandalorian foundling, he should have this. It's his right. Foundling. Perhaps he is a Padawan now. I warned you when we met. Your attachment to Grogu would be difficult to let go of. The Mandalorian wanted you to have this. But before you take it, I will give you a choice. This is a lightsaber. It belonged to my teacher, Master Yoda, and now I'm offering it to you. But you may choose only one. If you choose the armor, you'll return to your friend, the Mandalorian. However, you will be giving into attachment to those that you love and forsaking the way of the Jedi. But if you choose the lightsaber, you will be the first student in my academy, and I will train you to be a great Jedi, Jedi, Jedi. Book of Boba Fett, Episode 6. To start off this episode, I want to revisit something I recently picked up on from an earlier episode. In Chapter 4, there was a scene where Chrysanthemum the Wookiee was about to rip the arms off of a Trandoshan, which was a lizard-slash-dinosaur-like creature. He was stopped by Garza Fwip, the proprietor of the sanctuary. She told Chrysanthemum about how much she had enjoyed his days as a fighting Wookiee gladiator, and how he won every battle he faced and that the displays of violence were not necessary anymore. She said that in this era in the galaxy, after the Empire had been defeated, it was a more civilized place and a more civilized time. Now, while we know that the New Republic technically has oversight of the galaxy in this era, it does appear that they are leaving worlds like Tatooine somewhat to their own devices, leaving it up to them on how to rule. This is interesting to me, as it's a vast contrast to the Empire in its totalitarianism. This new era in the galaxy now appeared to allow people to self-manage and self-rule, which I think is a much better system than what we have even in our world currently. And also you see from her statements that the Empire's brutality bred more and more brutality throughout the galaxy. That is indicative of the downfall of society, when the moral and ethical codes that guide people are more and more inverted. Just like in our world, the more violent, the more sexual, and the more satanic the show or movie, the more popular they become. It's a continual bloodlust that spirals society downward. Now on to chapter 6. This episode starts out with a great scene with Cobb Vanth, who's the Star Wars equivalent of a Wild West Sheriff. We were introduced to him in The Mandalorian. He attacks a group smuggling drugs and is left with a large container of the drug called Spice after he defeats them. Now, he could have taken the Spice, sold it, and made a fortune. But instead, he dumped it out and let it blow away in the desert. I love the symbolism here. As I've had a close loved one die to drug addiction, I really appreciate seeing on-screen characters take the high road with a high moral code when they choose not to deal with drugs or profit off of them. Drugs are another area that are glamorized in our society through many shows, as many criminals and gangsters make millions off of drug users and junkies. It's important to, even when you're watching fiction, to think about the devastating effects that these drugs have, 
and how despicable these characters are for pushing them. We should despise these characters as much as we despise the government and Big Pharma for pushing their experimental drugs in our world today. Later on, we see Cobb Vanth again, and this time he has a showdown with Cad Bane, who's a great character that was brought to life from the Clone Wars animated series. Before this showdown, however, he is approached by the Mandalorian about assisting them in the fight against the Pike Syndicate. Cobb responds that he doesn't want him and his townspeople to get involved, but Din Djarin the Mandalorian tells him that, listen, the battle will come to you whether you like it or not. There's a great quote from the New Hope novelization where Luke had a similar approach to not joining the rebellion with his friend Biggs. Biggs had recently left the Imperial Academy and was joining up with the rebellion to fight against the Empire, and he returned to Tatooine to try to convince Luke to join him as well. Luke had been telling Biggs how he was content to stay on his family's farm and help out his uncle. And Biggs said, I feel for you, Luke. Someday you're going to have to learn to separate what seems to be important from what really is important. What good is all your uncle's work if it's taken over by the Empire? I've heard that they're starting to imperialize commerce in all the outlying systems. It won't be long before your uncle and everyone else on Tatooine are just tenants slaving for the greater glory of the Empire. To which Luke responds, that couldn't happen here. You said it yourself. The Empire won't bother with this rock. And then Biggs responds, things change, Luke. Only the threat of rebellion keeps many in power from doing certain unmentionable things. If that threat is completely removed, well, there are two things that men have never been able to satisfy. Their curiosity and their greed. And there isn't much that the high imperial bureaucrats are curious about. So you see here how the symbolization and the parallel between what's going on with the Pike Syndicate. The Pike Syndicate is looking to take over Tatooine. And while Cobb Vanth and his town may not be worried about it right now, it's going to affect him in the future. During the battle with Cad Bane, Cobb Vanth tells him that their town is now called Freetown, as it used to be called Mos Pelgo. Cad is threatening them to assist the evil Pike Syndicate instead of helping Boba Fett and the Mandalorian in this upcoming war. The irony here is that the people living in a town called Freetown aren't going to take kindly to someone coming in there and threatening them and their freedom and try to tell them what to do. I mean, think of what would happen if a crazy leftist would go into Florida to try to p tell people what to do. Yeah, that's not going to happen. It's not going to work out right. Clearly, these threats are going to backfire and incentivize the townspeople to get involved with the Boba team. Now, let's get into the Luke Skywalker and Baby Yoda stuff. We were promised a reunion of the Mandalorian and Baby Yoda last episode, and we nearly got it. But we did get to see a lot of Luke and his path towards becoming a really strong Jedi Master. First and foremost, we have to talk about the elephant in the room. Luke's hut from this episode, and how it resembled Luke's hut from his seclusion on the island of Octu in the last Jedi movie. Which, to remember, is the most divisive film in Star Wars history. I'm not sure why the similarity is shown here. Perhaps they are paying homage to it. But also, perhaps Lucasfilm was trying to stoke the fires of fan controversy once again. It didn't really seem necessary to me. Perhaps it was just to throw a bone to the fans of that movie and show some minor connective tissue to it. I don't know. Now, we do get a lot of dialogue here with Luke regarding his training with Baby Yoda. And it's interesting that both him and Ahsoka, who does show up in this episode too... They both seem to be pushing the old-school Jedi tenet of attachments being forbidden. Now, as you recall from the prequels, the idea of no attachments is a part of what turned Anakin away from the Jedi Order. On one hand, the Jedi were inherently supposed to love and protect others, but on the other hand, the lines seemed to be drawn around romantic relationships, or quite honestly, even family relationships. Think about the Jedi Padawans. They all went to train at the Jedi Temple at a very early age, leaving their family behind them, just as Anakin did when he left his mother behind. Now, when you contrast this with Luke Skywalker and his Jedi journey, he basically forsook the Jedi Council principle of no attachments, as it was his attachment to his father Anakin that saved the galaxy from the rule of the Emperor. By sacrificing himself in front of Vader, he brought back out the light in Anakin. And remember too, Yoda and Obi-Wan told Luke to kill Vader which would have actually played right into the Emperor's hands and would have brought him down the dark side path instead. 
So it's curious that the attachment angle is being brought up again. Now, maybe this may lead to Luke realizing the error of it as we move forward in the story. We'll see. Part of this attachment dialogue is the choice that Luke gives to Baby Yoda at the end of the episode. Either he can take Yoda's lightsaber and continue on the Jedi path, or he can take the Mandalorian armor that Din made for him and follow the path of the Mandalorian. So really either a Padawan or a Foundling. Now this binary choice is something you see over and over again in our culture and society and movies. There is no middle ground. There is only this extreme or that extreme. You can't get the best of both worlds. This binary decision did show up in the original Star Wars, symbolically, where Luke was out staring at the two suns on Tatooine. To me, this symbolized the two paths he could take. One, stay behind and continue his farming life, or two, go on a new adventure. You also saw such a binary decision in one of my favorite movies, Donnie Darko, where a teacher asked Donnie to determine whether a hypothetical, ethical dilemma fell in one of the binary positions of either fear or love. He was confused and brought up the whole spectrum of human emotion and talked about how things can't just be lumped into one category or another specifically. There are shades. Now think about the character of Ahsoka that we see in this episode. She did train to be a Jedi, but she decided to leave the Jedi Order when she saw how wrong they were about certain things back in the Clone Wars era. She took the path of being a Force user, but one that didn't necessarily have to appease the rigid Jedi doctrines. This is no different than someone who chooses to be a Christian, but doesn't abide by all of the tenets of a specific sect within Christianity, like the Baptists, Presbyterians, Lutherans, etc. To this kind of person, the study and analysis of the Bible is their guide, not everyone else's interpretation of it. So there can and should be some gray area when it comes to adopting a belief system with ridiculously rigid sets of rules. I mean, who's to say that Baby Yoda can't be a Jedi and a Mandalorian simultaneously? Finally, we see even more application of the transhumanist agenda here in this episode. The recreation of 1983 era Mark Hamill as Luke Skywalker here is amazing. It looks even better and more realistic than anything we have seen in past projects. But now we are approaching an age where it seems an actor's age is no longer an issue. They can be recreated digitally whenever needed. Now the digital creation doesn't seem to stop at just the visuals though. It was said in the creation of this episode that the voice of Luke was created using AI in mashups of lines of dialogue Mark Hamill had said in the past. Which could get to a scary level if used deviously. I mean, think about this. I have many hours of my voice available to the public here on the podcast. Who's to say that someone couldn't piece my words together to say something terribly wrong or offensive as a means to cancel me? I do envision this happening in the future to people in the alternative media, or even those who just don't play ball with the agendas of the day. While I think a lot of technology is cool and can be used to make our lives better, things like this will always make me worried. Well, this has been Conspiracy Kyle for another episode of Conspiracy in the Force. Stay tuned to the podcast for more content dropping this week. And then next Monday, I will have the breakdown of the seventh chapter of the Boba Fett series, which is the final chapter in season one. May the Force be with you, and God bless.